You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. There's a powerful ethic in the Jewish tradition based on the biblical promise to Abraham that he would be the father of a nation that would bring blessings to the other nations of the world. And a similar ethic that issues out of the prophetic book of Isaiah where it is written, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and will establish you as a covenant of the people for a light unto the nations. There's sometimes a tragic misunderstanding concerning traditional Jewish values. The sage rabbis taught repeatedly that the Jewish people has a responsibility to be a light unto the nations. The Jews have an ethical responsibility to care for the world as a whole. So the Jewish law mandates that in any society where Jews are treated as equal citizens, the same interpersonal mitzvot commandments which require a Jew to treat other Jews fairly and honestly and with compassion, applies to the laws governing how a Jew is to treat non-Jews. Jews have a responsibility to act in righteousness and in kindness and in justice and to work to free any people enslaved by any form of tyrant or tyranny. And if you ever hear an argument that suggests that Jews only have a responsibility to care for other Jews, such a position is in direct contravention of Jewish tradition and is simply a gross and often self-serving distortion of Jewish values. And one of the Jewish organizations on the world Jewish scene that has done amazing work to heal and help the enslaved and impoverished in places around the globe is the American Jewish World Services, known to everyone as AJWS. And I want you to see now a piece of a humorous public service announcement Hollywood actors made to honor and to promote the work of AJWS. I'm Don Johnson, and I'm not Jewish. I'm Danny Trejo, and I'm not Jewish. You want to hear a secret? I'm not Jewish. Okay, fine, I'm Jewish, you got me. What gave it away? Seinfeld? Although I'm not even close to being Jewish, I support the American Jewish World Service. This past quarter century, AJWS has demonstrated that through activism, individuals can change the world. AJWS funds more than 80 organizations worldwide that are working to alleviate hunger. Last year, American Jewish World Service gave away more than $22 million in grants to 458 organizations in 34 different countries. That really throws a wrench in the Jews are cheap premise. I mean, if, if you think that's cheap, there's no way you're Asian because you're really bad at math. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindsay Lohan, and I am not Jewish, but I am happy to be here. These things pay well, right? People ask me if I'm Jewish because of the way I talk. Well, I choose to be like Madonna. I don't want to announce I'm Jewish until I need the publicity. AJWS grants promote human rights by supporting programs developed and run by the communities themselves. AJWS was a major responder to the Indian Ocean tsunami, supporting 82 grassroots organizations over the last five years with more than $11 million raised from 42,000 donors. AJWS was one of the first responders in Haiti. Still no luck getting Sean Penn circumcised, though. I know what you're thinking. I've already given enough money to charities this year. Well, newsflash, downloading the Angry Birds app on your phone doesn't count as charity. Jews are givers. 
They see people in need. They may be pushy about it, but they're going to help you. They may be annoying as they do it, but they will do it. You know, it's like、uh, somebody's saving you from a fire, and the whole time they're saying, You had to wear that sweater? I gave you a red sweater. You're wearing the blue sweater? People often come up to me and they'll say, Hey, Sandberg, I didn't even know you were Jewish. And I say, Really? And they go, No, not really. Look at your gigantic face. And then we just laugh and laugh. And then I go, All right, talk to you later, Ryan Seacrest. So call the number at the bottom of your screen. There's no number. So text DREDEL to 90999. No. No. Send a self addressed stamp MATZA to. Mr. Mayor, Mr. please. I support this organization because it fosters civil society. Sustainable development and human rights for all people, not just Jewish people or African American people like me. The AJWS helps people of all religions all over the world alleviate poverty, hunger, and disease. And that's something you don't need to be Jewish to support. The American Jewish World Service, that is an awful name. That name is so bad, it feels like a scam from Nigeria, really. AJWS is really just not an easy acronym, is it? It's confusing. It's like saying California. United States, Lutheran Earth, Service of the Moon. Is it a world thing? Is it a, is it, is it a Jewish thing? It's got to be punchy. Uh, 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 like, you know, MS, boom. TMZ, boom. Something simpler, like、uh, Jews helping Goyim. Maybe next year, if you guys thought about maybe changing it to Jewish American World Service, because then you're Jaws. And then you can have Jaws Week on Discovery Channel. They have Shark Week. You have Jaws Week, and it's all just Jews. I am not Jewish, but I still fully support American Jewish World Service. Why? Well, as our friend Tevya said, tradition. He also went on to say, Yubba diddy dibby, yada yada dibby diddy dum. I just want to say you should only have mazel on this anniversary and nachis from this occasion. Shalom! Meshuggah. Bubula! Mazel tov! Klup and Taylor Mattel comes oil. Hala! Bread. The truth is, the nonprofit AJWS is one of the most respected humanitarian organizations in operation today, providing invaluable assistance and emergency relief to people in need around the world. And the woman who drives the work of AJWS is its remarkable. President and CEO, and one of the most highly respected women on the world stage today, Ruth Messenger. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Ruth's long and impressive history of public service, especially if you're a New Yorker. Ruth has been involved in democratic politics for decades, served on the City Council of New York for 11 years, was Manhattan Borough President for eight years, even ran for mayor, only to be defeated by Rudy Giuliani. But her standing now is of international stature through her work with AJWS. And wherever human beings are in dire need of help, from a tsunami in Indonesia to a Hurricane Katrina in the southern U.S. to an earthquake in Haiti or attempts to annihilate a people in Darfur, Ruth Messenger lives and leads a life that reflects the highest values of the Jewish tradition's call to, yes, indeed, be. Our brother's keeper. And Ruth Messenger, you know I've wanted you in this chair for a long time. I can't thank you enough for joining me. Thank you. If I knew that you were going to introduce me with words that would make either, even my mother <laughs> blush, I might have been here earlier. I'm not sure. That's very sweet. You know, I knew your mother and worked with your mother, Marjorie Weiler. Marjorie, for those of you who may not know, Marjorie was. It's more than a pioneer. For a, for a period of time, Ruth, your mother cradled Jewish media in America. She was the producer of Eternal Light for the JTS, and on it, we saw it on NBC every week. And then, lucky, lucky me, Ruth, when your mother left JTS, she came to work for Jewish Education and Media, produced、right. L'Chaim, put the program on a national channel, Vision, brought us to.、Uh, Tens of thousands of people, especially non Jews, who wanted to see Jewish programming. And I was a real, real fan of your mother as I am of you. Thank so, you. That, so, first of all, tell me a little bit about how you become you. You know, you just you, answered your own question. <laughs> was it your mother and father? Yeah. 
my, Tell me about I was, them. I, my sister, sister and I were raised in a home that took very seriously a couple of notions. One, give something back. We're here. We're doing well. We have distinguished heritage, active in the Jewish community, and that's a place where we ought to be working. But two, which I think is what my mother particularly honed for the seminary through the eternal light and through the full page high holiday ads, is Judaism is a faith that does not rest on what it prays or what it studies, but believes that it only works if you put it into action. Mm -hmm. And so you put it into action by meeting the needs of Jews, you put it into the action by caring for the future of the city, as the welfare of the city, as Jeremiah says. Um, and then my favorite quote, which comes from Rabbi Heschel, whom I was privileged to know through my mom, which is in a free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. So it's that ethic which my mother, I think, personified. My sister is a pediatrician. Um, I was in politics and now trying to make change on the international scene, in and with the Jewish community. Did your father play a role? My dad was... What was his name? Uh, uh, my dad's name was Wilfred Weiler. He, stood, he turned down his family business and went into uh, accounting, set up his own firm, which still exists, and was actually was quite famous in Jewish philanthropic agency circles. He was on the board and, and or was the treasurer of the uh, Hebrew Home and Hospital for, I think, 55 years. And he actually, using his professional skills, rewrote the contract, the retirement contract, for all of the conservative rabbis and cantors. So there are a lot of people around the United States who know what my father did for them. That's lovely. We may come back to politics later, but I first want to talk about the work you're now doing. Sure. Um, and we spoke off camera for a moment ago. Uh, a moment ago. You travel an enormous amount, and you've been to Haiti, you've been to Indonesia, you've been to, um, you just came back from Ethiopia, and then after Ethiopia, you came back from Uganda. Why? What is all the travel? Well, I, I think you have to answer that in, in uh, two uh, pieces, Mark. The work of American Jewish World Service, which you spoke of so graciously, is focused actually not only on disaster relief, but on long-term development. We're interested in those community leaders right now, 458 of them in 34 countries, who are making slow change, who are empowering women, who are improving agriculture, who are making it possible for girls to go to school. I make that point both because we are a development and human rights organization, but also because one of the great joys of being at AJWS and of traveling is to see change over time. So it's not only, although it is of course includes going to Haiti with rabbis, I think it was eight months after the earthquake to see how much chaos still existed and to try to make sure that we were using donor funding in the most responsible way. But it's also to visit a group that's been doing HIV AIDS work in Uganda for six or seven years and now sort of has their systems down pat and recruits people, about half of whom are themselves HIV positive, gets them on medication, and then turns those people into community health workers who go out and reach the rest of their own community in a way that frankly and clearly no Westerner ever could. Mm -hmm. So we support those groups to do that. So the travel, for me, is one of the perks of the job. Mm -hmm. I get to see progress over time, and I get to take donors to see the work that they are helping us to support. And is that one of the main reasons you do travel? You bring people with you? Absolutely. It, it, I would imagine it is the most effective way to teach people. It's one thing to see a TV ad or to even hear a lecture, but to travel to the places you can bring people to right. and let us see what we see, that has a power that is indescribable. It does. And I'd say that there's a particular reason to take, even though obviously if you're doing work in New Jersey or in New York, you can take people to see it tomorrow. One of the reasons that it's worth taking people a much longer distance to see what we do, first of all, is to be sure they understand that the vision and the leadership for change is coming from local people. It's very easy if you sit in New York or Geneva or Washington or London or at the United Nations to believe that we actually know better what people here need or people there need. But actually, 
that goes against a, another critical Jewish value, B'Tselem Elohim. If you believe that every person is equally made in the image of God, then it ought to occur to you that they know best how to even fight gender-based violence in their community, how to undertake to start a microfinance fund. And so when I take donors, part of what happens is they see that the decisions and the infrastructure of the organization is being created by the local people. Second reason to take donors is if you live in New York, you can't believe that an average grant to a small grassroots organization of $30,000 changes the life of a community. And does it? Yes. And the minute you're there, you see it. And sometimes on any donor trip, we're going to Kenya in August, we're going to Haiti and the Dominican Republic next fall. People will see in any week that they travel with me groups that we've just started to help where we're very often the first funder, and it's what are they doing with $8,000 that's suddenly making themselves real in their community to groups that we're funding along with other organizations, and we may give them 30000 and they may have a budget of 300 to groups that we initially started funding eight years ago that have now become million-dollar organizations with a vast reach. But it's that small amount of money used responsibly by local leaders targeted to specific purposes. We maintain tight accountability. We do serious monitoring and evaluation. But I know from lots of travels with donors that every time a donor leaves a project, they say, what did you say we were giving them? Because <laughs> they just can't believe it. Can you give me one or two examples of some of the gifts you've made, the contributions you've made, which you feel have had stunning results? Yeah, there are a lot of them. Um, talk about a project I was just with in, uh, actually not just with, a couple years ago, in Kenya, a rural farming project called Killalee Self-Help Project. So the issue in much of the world, we don't have time to talk about all of this, but is that people have very small areas of land Sometimes the land is stolen from them. There's not much respect for land rights or land title. In the world, 80% of the farmers are women. And so have these women farming land that they don't hold title to. And very often, they land soil gets depleted, and they just don't see the possibility of even feeding their families, much less growing enough food to take to market. The Killily Self-Help Project, with relatively small grants, used the advice of outside agronomists used drip irrigation, which they learned from Israel, taught crop rotation. Now most of their members are growing enough food to feed their own families. Some of them are growing enough extra food that they can actually take it to market. And they're basically now sharing their technology community by community so that they've reached thousands of farmers. And of course, each of those farmers then is able to feed her family. It makes a real difference in people's lives. It's, it's in, in the case of food, it's dramatic. In the parts of the world where we work, the developing world called the Global South, the average poor person, people who have less than a dollar or sometimes less than two dollars a day, spend 75% of their income on food. You know, for those of us who live in New York, who live in affluence, it's only degrees of affluence, it's inconceivable that somebody could live on a dollar or two dollars a day, let alone less. Is there a way for you to help us see what that means? What does it mean for somebody to not have a dollar a day? Well, I would say that one thing we already talked about, it means that if they're not growing food or not able to grow the food they were, or if it's a bad growth season, they literally don't have enough to eat. Literally don't have enough to eat. and. Um, I don't want to dwell on bad statistics, but there are 25,000 people who die every day from lack of access to food, almost all of that in the parts of the world where we work. But let's go on beyond food. So they're living in some subsistence shack on some small piece of land. What's the next thing they can't do? They can't buy education and health care for their mm -hmm, children. Mm -hmm. And people may hear that education is free, but it's not really free in most of these parts of the world. A free education system requires that a family pay for uh, uniform, pay for uh, books, 
And even then, the family has to struggle with can they send, and the answer here is going to be no, can they send all their children to school because they need children to help with those fields that aren't growing enough food. They need one child to watch the younger children. So until we increase the income of these families, until we wipe out school fees and uniform costs, until we make schools actually physically available in some of these communities, people aren't going to get an education. I'll give you a dramatic piece of that story. Two-thirds of the children, um, about 80 million children in the world between 5 and 14 who aren't in school on any given day, and two-thirds of them are girls. So you can come up with lots of accurate and true descriptions. Boys are more valued. Girls are needed to stay home. The single fastest intervention to get more girls in school is to build a latrine because girls stop going to school when they stop, start menstruating because there are no bathrooms. So sometimes these changes don't cost very much money. They just take some serious planned intervention. And speak for a moment about the difficulty people have in obtaining health services. Well, that's, you know, it's not like that's a problem we've solved in this country. But um, there, are, there are no health services in most of the rural areas. Um, we basically, I would say, our work tends to be either in rural agricultural communities around the world or in large, and I have to sort of, I think I have to say gigantic urban slums. The Kibera slum and the Matari slum in Nairobi, they have a million people each living in these areas. And that's sort of a quality of life that's frankly hard to describe. But is there a clinic? Maybe. Does the clinic charge if you show up? Maybe. Who has the time and the resources? And then there's medicine. And so the biggest health scourge in the world, of course, right now is HIV AIDS. Much energy, good energy, focused on the access to antiretroviral drugs going through the governments of some of these countries, going through the Clinton Foundation, going through the United States Agency for International Development to get the drugs there. But what no one ever talks about is those drugs are toxic unless you have a, size, a healthy diet. If there's not enough food to eat, if you're not eating uh, nutritiously at the same time as you're trying to follow the drug regimen, the drugs will make you sicker. Now, people aren't stupid. If they have a bunch of pills and every time they take them they feel worse, they stop taking them. So all of these things need to be worked on holistically, comprehensively, and again, I want to have said this before, but they need to be worked on with the involvement of the local community. I just, in um, Uganda, I was just with a group, and they had a slogan, which I have not yet shared with all of my staff, but which seems to me is a slogan we should adopt for our work. And the slogan, which is on the back of their t-shirts, is nothing about us without us. And that, for me, that says a whole piece of what, what we believe. You said that, you, you described the way in which your own background, growing up, you and your sister, had a Jewish element to it. I know it's the American Jewish World Service. To what extent are the people you're working with Jewish? None. None. Well, but, let well, me well, back well, up. Wait, I, wanna, I, didn't ask, <laughs> I didn't ask the question right. And I right. didn't answer it right. I didn't so answer let's it. Try I didn't, again. Okay. What I mean is, I don't mean the people you're serving. In terms of the people who right. are in the organization, the donors you are able to attract and explain why their money could do such wonderful good, to what extent is, is your organization, not the people you serve, right. okay. Jewish? All right, so I didn't, you're correct. I didn't answer it right. properly. None of the people that we work with overseas are Jewish because those are not the marginalized people in these communities. Most of our fundraising is targeted by our choice because of who we are and because of the values that define us to the Jewish community. I want to be really clear. I'll take almost anybody's money. <laughs> but I do my fundraising by speaking in synagogues, by meeting with Jewish donors, by educating people about the Jewish responsibility to help that you spoke so eloquently about earlier. So many of those people are Jewish, and 
we consider it part of our job to be educating in the Jewish community about global responsibility. One of the ways we do that most powerfully is we're now placing 500 volunteers a year from the Jewish community with, some, with our projects in various of the countries where we work, not in every country. But the bulk of those 500 uh, volunteers are young people between the ages of 17 and 25. Mm. And of course, if they go to a community for the summer and build latrines, it's helpful to the community. If they go for a one week spring break and help the farmer get his coffee fields ready, it's helpful. But we are most interested in the impact that doing this work has on Jews that we want to have thinking in a more expansive way about global responsibility. You say it so beautifully. Permit me, I want you now to permit me to express to you the only criticism I've ever heard, and Please. I want to hear you answer it. The only criticism I ever hear goes something like this, Ruth. There is a large world out there, and when there are problems, there are many decent, good, charitable, charitable people who will help address the world's needs. Then, in addition, there are Jewish needs. They should never be exclusive, but the reality is that when it comes to Jewish needs, if Jews don't tend to address those needs, if Jews don't support Jewish causes, it's not likely that there will be a large percentage of non-Jews involved. And therefore, the ethic goes in the Jewish community. A Jew's first responsibility, not his only responsibility, but the first responsibility is to care for other Jews. And that an organization like yours, the only thing you can say of a negative nature is, does it in some way mislead Jews into thinking that their, own, their only responsibility is to the world at large and that it does not encourage Jews to be involved in helping where, in fact, Jewish needs cry for help? Well, I think, you know, the answer to that was in many ways contained in your question. We are for sure not an either-or organization. Um, I would say that every member of our staff, Jewish members of our staff and non-Jewish members of our staff, is her or himself involved philanthropically. People choose their own charities. There's every expectation in the Jewish community, I think it's a good thing, that Jews will contribute to a congregation, that they may fund their local federation, that they're interested in Jewish organizations. But, let me point out, most of the Jewish organizations that people choose to support in their own communities, the local Jewish family service, the local Jewish Meals on Wheels, those programs help non-Jews. Including federations. All federation all agencies. And, and there's a benefit to that, which is, first of all, it's fulfilling the commandment you spoke about earlier, Jews and non-Jews. The rabbis say that many, many times. By the way, in, in uh, the Talmud, they say, for the sake of peace, which is to say, like, let's spread goodwill. Let's be sure we're not attacked for being exclusive. Let's be part of the broader polity. So locally, Jewish contributions to Jewish organizations in a good way are helping both Jews and non-Jews. But beyond that, there are these one billion people in the world. They're going to need a lot of help. They don't have support systems. They don't have a local church or mosque that can just rally support. They don't have the structure for soup kitchens. So government aid from all over the world, non-governmental aid, and non-governmental aid that is faith-based are all critical resources for those people. Now, I would go further if I were really pushed and say that the same text that you were quoting so eloquently before suggests that regardless of income, a Jew should give between 10 and 20 percent of his or her resources for charity. And I suspect that there are not lots of people watching this program or in one of my audiences who are meeting that standard. So there's room to grow and to change and to increase our support for those in need. How do you view the state of Israel in this entire sphere? There are many people who feel that the work Israel does 
in African nations and in undeveloped countries around the world is not given enough positive attention. To what extent are you in some way pleased with the efforts Israel is making in the same way you are? Okay, well, let me, let me step back a minute and say American Jewish World Service doesn't work in Israel of or course. on Israeli Middle East issues. But you are correct that one of the places that we encounter Israel is in doing um, technical work, particularly technical advisory work, in places in the, in the developing world. I've actually been and seen Israeli water projects that we actually helped to bring to Senegal. And I have to say, to be honest with you, I've also seen sites of former Israeli-run model farms that are no longer being funded by the Israeli government. The more work that anybody is doing, American Jewish World Service, the government of Israel, Catholic Relief Services, the government of the Netherlands, the more work that anyone is doing in these places where there is abject poverty, one, the more help is available, but two, the better it makes those entities look. So when Israel steps in after a disaster, and I've seen this with my own eyes, puts up a field hospital in Macedonia for um, victims of the ethnic cleansing in Kosovar and can put up a field hospital, literally put up a field hospital in a few hours with balloon walls, the more impressive that is and the more the attention they deserve for having done that. So I'm proud when that happens. But we are fundamentally, as you suggested before, both an organization that will provide immediate relief after a disaster, but also long-term development assistance. And by the way, one thing we haven't mentioned, we also do public policy work in Washington. So where there's an issue like forgiveness of foreign debt or the need to fund HIV AIDS work, where we know that actions in Washington would help virtually all of the people who are part of our partner organizations, we will do that policy work as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you would be comfortable with this perspective. I'm now speaking for myself. I think it is essential that those who take the Jewish tradition seriously are involved in acts of milut chasadim, helping other people, and the fact that they're Jewish or not Jewish is irrelevant, and that Jews have a responsibility to people of the world, and that Talmudic law demands of us a certain kind of ethical sensitivity to every human being, regardless of whether they're Jewish or not. The only thing that sometimes disturbs me is that I sometimes see a liberal ethic in our Jewish community which is very sensitive to all the problems of mankind, but that in some way there is a distancing from anything Jewish and from Israel. And when I hear that or feel that or encounter that, I feel it is, is as wrong as it would be to encounter a Jew whose attitude is, I only care about Jews. That both extremes are wrong. And that one of the reasons why I've sort of I am such a fan of yours, is that you have been able to bridge from a very liberal perspective a gap which many other Jewish liberals don't seem able to bridge. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I Good. want to, to know the extent to which you feel comfortable with what I'm saying or not. Well, I guess the only, I, the way I would step back is to say, like, I don't, I try, except with my children and grandchildren, I try, other, other than that, I try not to tell people how they should live their lives and how they should think about their tzedakah work. So I talk to audiences. When I talk to an audience, Mark, I believe that what I'm saying will apply differently to different people. I, I believe in any audience, whether it's the 50 people or 300 people sitting in front of me at a Shabbat service or it's the broader community to get to talk to through a program like this, that there will and there ought to be people who define their own personal charity as focused in on their immediate neighborhood. Like I'm the person, somebody might say, who just takes care of anybody in East Orange in trouble. Um, or I'm the person whose focal concern is about the Jews in need in America or I'm the person whose focus is the Middle East, there will also be, and there ought to be, and it must be seen 
as quintessentially part of what Judaism is all about, the people who work out to those who are today's other and today's stranger. Ruth, you have seen a great deal of suffering in the work you do. You see people who are oppressed in all forms, in all ways, economically and also in terms of just their right to have freedom. Has anything you've ever seen made you cry? The answer to that is certainly yes. I want to step back a minute and say you're right that in this job I see some pretty horrible situations. I couldn't do the work that I do if when I was, when I was traveling from country to country I was basically looking in on the people whose lives are the worst off, period. What sustains me is that the work that these people are doing on their own behalf, the work that we at American Jewish World Service are privileged to support, is like a beacon of hope for making change. So that's what's really powerful, is that you see people who don't have more than a dollar a day, whose circumstances are pretty appalling, in a country where perhaps you can't say anything good about the government, but they're nevertheless have gotten their act together, thinking about making change, know what they need to do, are sustaining each other. It's those signs of hope that are what make the job so fulfilling and make me feel hopeful about the world. That's wonderful. You see, I, and I'm glad to hear you say this because part of my imagination is that what you're in the midst of all the time, in the extraordinary work you do, is such human pain and that it would just wrench one's heart all the time. To hear you say that there's also moments when you see real, real change that inspires hope in you, it makes me, it makes me happy for you. Yes, and I good. also under, I understand suddenly more of what sustains all the people who you work with and who are making this extraordinary contribution to other people. Do I have it right? Yes, you have it right. <laughs> That's really well wonderful. Said. All right, so I want to change the focus for a moment. You have spent so much of your life giving to the community through the political arena. From afar, politics looks like it is almost as painful as some of the things you do through AJWS. In other words, there's a feeling among many people, Ruth, now that cynicism is the appropriate response to what we see on the political scene. You were inside it, Ruth. When you were inside politics, when you were inside the city council, when you were the borough president of Manhattan, and you ran for mayor of this city, you knew as much about the intimacy of the political scene in New York as anyone. As you look back on it, if you were to write a book about your experiences, would you be more critical than complimentary of the process? No. Um, I think, uh, I believe that Winston Churchill said something like, um, you know, the least attractive, messiest form of government is democracy. Unfortunately, they haven't invented anything else um, or anything better. Um, so you do see a lot of its inner workings, and there are some things to dismay. Uh, and in some ways, I'm afraid I do think that some of those things have gotten worse. But you also see great signs of hope. You also see people actually organizing in their own community, lobbying government not to make certain cuts, pushing for funding for projects that will actually help the most needy people in their neighborhoods. It may not look like Ghana or Peru, but it's still a neighborhood that needs help. But you're talking about community efforts. You're not talking about political effectiveness. But the question then is, does the, does the polity, does the government respond? Yes, does it? Yes, in many, many instances. And that depends, I know you know I'm going to say this, on the quality of the leaders. And that depends on the commitment and the education of the electorate. We didn't have a chance during this program to talk about Haiti. I would just note, we don't need to do that now, but I would just note that in a country with a 200-year history of 
interventions by the United States and corruption on the part of its own government and an election that they've been trying to hold during this entire post-earthquake year and the election runoff just this week. Huge numbers of Haitians came out to vote and waited three or four hours. You tell me where that happens mm -hmm. in New York or New Jersey. People go to the polls and if they hear that a machine broke, they leave. People say all the time, oh, there's no difference between the candidates. It's virtually not possible that that's the case. And I, tell <laughs> that to, I tell that to young people. I'm a, I'm a product of a, an era in this country in which I knew people who lost their lives fighting for the rights of people in the South to vote. And I don't think there's ever an excuse for missing an election. And if you treat all p politicians with cynicism and contempt, then you will get cynical and contemptible politicians. At the moment, are you pleased with the political leadership in this country? Oh, that's different. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yes, I'm, you I'm, are. The answer, you are pleased. Well, the, look. I mean, that's. I think now we're getting on. I mean, I don't consider myself any longer anything other than a than a citizen. I understand. Um, but I will say that because American Jewish World Service has a an advocacy agenda that we're trying to move in this Congress and with this White House, I am dismayed by the cuts that are being proposed, which would damage lives both domestically and for sure globally. But I nevertheless can name for you serious thoughtful leaders, members of Congress, the President, members of the executive branch who are fighting to continue to do the right thing in Darfur, to help this, the government of South Sudan become an independent country, to um, deal with some of the messiness of our international humanitarian aid, which doesn't proceed very smoothly. So maybe I'm just good at finding the bright spots, but I certainly see people, even right now, in the particular era that we're in, who are fighting to do the right thing. There are days when I think there aren't going to be enough of them to win some votes. Obviously, you spent your life in democratic politics as part of the Democratic Party. Do you respect individuals who are in both parties? And is there a, in your mind, an ethical difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party? I'm not going to answer the second question because the answer to the first question is, I respect those people in politics, and by that I mean both people who hold office, who are running for office, who are active on the political scene. I respect people based on who they are, mm -hmm. based on what vision they have, based on how much integrity they have. I disrespect those people who use their offices to get themselves and others into trouble. I am dismayed when those people get coverage that perhaps they deserve, but which continues to give politics a bad name. So I'm interested in the individual and what she or he is doing to make change locally, nationally, or internationally. Where do you go for your own information? And I ask that because there are people who now feel the biggest problem facing concerned Americans is that we don't know where we're going to, where we can get as honest a, a, an accounting of what is going on as possible. So I would be interested in where you go for your news. I think that's really a, an important question. I am, um, I, am, I am who I am, so I read the New York Times from cover to cover every day. Is it I as am, good as it used to be? I think it covers a great deal of the news fairly well. It okay. does require a kind of exhaustive reading. Um, but I certainly have become aware as I've gotten older, but particularly as I've gotten taken this job, that um, much of the world that I'm concerned with now doesn't get covered any place in the American press. And um, so the, that's the bad news. The good news is that in addition to some sources like BBC, Reuters, um, whatever, you can find out a little more of what's going on. And then the best news, although it takes time, is that the web opens up access to all kinds of sources of information. You know, the, the ongoing crises in Darfur and in Sudan are, I won't say they're resolved because, because they're not resolved, but it's 
for me, somebody like me, for, for me, for my, somebody my age, to be able to actually use Google Earth to see a place in Darfur that I've been and to see that the camp for displaced persons is growing in size when a news report might tell me that the president of Sudan says that there's nobody left. You know, you can actually see it. I mean, so you have a very different capacity for getting a view on the world. And I would just say, as a, as a grandmother of many grandchildren, uh, this next generation has an immense capacity to find the information that they want. And they're much more adept at it than you and I are. <laughs> so you're optimistic in that sense? Yes. That's lovely. If you would want us to be concerned, aware, of where the problems facing humanity are today, what are the places we should be aware of? You know, I think that's different. Because we're talking about a physical, specific place. Then I'm going to mention Congo, because millions of people have been killed, and it's never made the world seen, because some of the fights in Congo between and among groups are, are not because of the poverty of the country, but because of actually the available mineral resources that people are fighting over, in at least one case, because it's a mineral that's usable in our cell phones. Those are sort of like tragedies that you don't want to wrap your mind around, but you have to. But I think to ask sort of the question is like, I wouldn't focus too much on geography, because it could always come up with aspects of the crisis in Haiti. We don't work in Japan, but clearly aspects of the crisis there. Um, I think it's more important to start looking at these big issues. We, we have a known health pandemic. We have drugs that allow most people who are HIV positive or have full-blown AIDS to live long lives. And many of the people in the world don't have access to those drugs. We have enough food in the world to feed all the people in the world twice over. And as I told you, 25,000 people a day die of hunger. So it's those endemic problems about the, the distribution of resources, the attention that is or is not paid to the dangers of um, oppressive dictators, the crises of land rights and resource rights and water access. It's, it's those kinds of problems that I think need much more attention from many more of us, including our national politicians, mm -hmm. who sometimes forget how much worse off most of the rest of the world is. And how would you assess now how well Jews in general and the formal Jewish community, formal Jewish leadership, to, how well are we doing and what do you wish Jews did better? I'm regularly totally um, encouraged and totally dismayed by examples of where we're doing well and where we're not. Uh, where we should be going, I want to go right back to what you said early in the program. We live in an era in which it's not popular to talk about obligation or responsibility, but we come from a faith that says, look at responsibilities, look at obligation, be sure you're putting what you believe into action or it's not worth very much. And no surprise, all of us, starting right here, have more to do to make that a reality. It's impossible to believe there's more you could be doing. I don't know how you find enough hours in the day to do all you do. You are a remarkable human yeah, If being. I paid, played less solitaire, I could get more <laughs> done at my desk. And I want anyone now who has heard you and is drawn to you and would want to be involved in your work how do, we, how do we be in touch with you? I think that really the most important thing that we've been able to do at American Jewish World Service, I hope people will agree, is to develop a website that really is easy to manage and provides lots of information. So at www.ajws.org, you can look for hunger. You can look up for the world's latest disaster. You can see how you might take action in your community. You can find out about our service programs. And I would love that people who are at all interested in what you and I have been discussing, you know, set aside a half an hour, watch the hilariously funny Judd Apatow video, but then spend the next 25 minutes scrolling through our website, learning from it, and thinking how, in each case, you might become a better global citizen. You help us every day in that endeavor, 
it is so gracious of you to come and sit with me and talk. Delighted. And again, uh, as someone who has watched your work and thrilled to what you do, it's an honor to be able to sit with you. It's an honor to be able yes. to introduce you to the audience if they don't know the work you do. Thank you. in all you do, Thank and I hope we very, get to talk much. very, very often. Thank you, so. Ruth. Thank You're you. wonderful. Good. Thanks a lot. And those are the thoughts of Ruth Messenger, president and CEO of AJWS, American Jewish World Services. I hope you enjoyed meeting her. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments to the ideas expressed by Ruth Messenger. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support. L'Chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.